Well, it all started with a little stiffness in my left hand. And they noticed my movement is, was decreasing. Even before the tremor showed up, uh, I was very depressed. In the early 2000s, I started losing my sense of smell. When I compared symptoms with a friend of mine who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, I started checking the list and saying, I've got that too and that too. We both cried. What I understand about Parkinson's is there's no cure. The neurons in my brain that produce dopamine are dying off. When your symptoms manifest... I want to welcome everyone to uh, Scripps Green Hospital. It's going to be, a, I think, an exciting evening, especially for those of us who have special interest in Parkinson's research. I'm Jerry Henberger. I'm the executive director with the Parkinson's Association. Uh, we are the uh, organization that is working with the Summit for Stem Cell Research uh, fundraising group and this fundraising group uh, is a remarkable group of people um, they are uh, volunteers they are daredevils they go out of their way to uh, raise money and to raise awareness for this project um, they're very passionate about what they do and one thing I want to stress to everyone here is that this is a unique program 100% of your donations, of your dollars that you put towards this program goes directly to the science. The Parkinson's Association isn't taking any percentages. Uh, none scripts, research, scripts, health. Uh, it's all going to the science. Um, I, I, it, it's really a remarkable feat, and it couldn't happen without all of you. So thank you for that. I do want to mention you're going to get an opportunity to see later on in the program how hardcore some of these fundraisers are. They are exceptional. They've climbed mountaintops, they've climbed big mountaintops, all in this passionate effort to see this science come to a reality. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Melissa Hauser. For tonight's agenda, what we're gonna talk about is how did this project start uh, the limitations in current Parkinson's disease therapy, uh, the idea of stem cell therapy for Parkinson's disease may be eliminating those uh, limitations and our specific project. So how did this get started? Well, really it was because my Parkinson's disease patients demanded action. In 2004, when Proposition 71 was passed by California taxpayers, $3 billion given for what they said, this measure shall be known as the California Stem Cell Research and Cure Initiative. My patients kept coming in, well, okay, where's the cure? I said, wait, we've got a lot of preparatory work to do. We've got a lot of preliminary work to do in the lab before we can get to this stage. They said, how long? I said, well, maybe five, maybe seven years. Ten years have come, <laughs> and they're like this. Well, how long am I going to wait? And now it's becoming something more on the order of can I wait? Because for a Parkinson's patient, 10 years, 15 years can be a really long time. The clinical trials are on the horizon, but as the Parkinson's physician, I decided to sort of probe it a little bit. So the idea began when myself and Sherry Gold, my nurse practitioner, started to talk about, well, who on the, what they call the MESA, and there's lots of good work being done right here in San Diego in, in stem cell research, would we best be fitted with? Um, the Scripps Research Institute was an obvious choice, and we knew of Dr. Loring's exemplary international reputation in stem cell research. So we went to her, and I said, we have the need, and she said, I have the science, and we said, let's collaborate, and Summit for Stem Cell was born. So in order to explain to you why there's limitations in Parkinson's disease therapy, I have to explain a little bit about what goes on with the Parkinsonian brain. So deep within the brain, there's a system of cells called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are in charge of movement. If they're not working properly, you either move too much, like tremor, or you don't move well, like difficulty walking, which we all take for granted. The chemical messenger in the basal ganglia is dopamine. It's the chemical that allows the cells to talk to one another. Without dopamine, the signals can't get through to the rest of the brain, and the brain can't get the rest of the signals through to the body, and movement becomes very limited. Patients get frozen, tremor, 
gait freezing, very slow of movement, among what, uh, other symptoms. So, okay, if we're lacking in dopamine in the Parkinson's brain and we don't know why that happens and we can't prevent it, what do we do about it? Well, you give it back in the form of a pill. This is dopamine. It was developed in 1967. And as you can see, since that time, we've had a lot of other drugs delivered, but to me, the pharmaceutical and research industry has sort of failed us because all of these drugs still revolve around this one drug, dopamine, and dopamine itself has limitations. So we're waiting. We're waiting for something more dramatic to come along than medications. So if dopamine levodopa works, well, why isn't that enough? Well, it's because dopamine only partially works. It's a leaky Band-Aid and it doesn't work forever. One of the problems is the duration of response. At first, when I give a Parkinson's patient drugs, they love me. There's a honeymoon period. It lasts for about six hours between doses and then it slowly, as the disease advances, becomes less and less of a therapeutic window. So now you're having to take a pill like every hour, whereas you used to be able to take it every six hours. Not only that, but there's this pulsatile nature of giving the brain dopamine. A normal brain, we'll call me normal, is constantly bathed in dopamine. We have normal buffering capacities and we produce and process dopamine normally. But if you only give it in the form of a pill, the brain gets a bit confused and it can't process it properly. It's not a continuous supply, it's a pulsatile supply. It peaks, it troughs, it peaks, it troughs. And if you're doing it every one hour, it leads to problems like dyskinesia and off times. So not only is it not a completely reliable treatment, dopamine in and of itself causes motor complications. So what are motor complications? Well, the most severe of those is now you have dopamine working too well. Now you have too much movement. This is the problem that Michael J. Fox has, like the wiggles. And this is a, an instance of a severe case of dyskinesia. This patient has had Parkinson's for a while. She was on moderate to high doses of, of levodopa. And as you can tell, it's not the Parkinsonian features that are bothering so much as the involuntary tongue thrusting, the involuntary movements. If you have enough of that, as you can imagine, you start to burn lots of calories and you lose weight. So levodopa, as good as it is, is still imperfect and we need to come up with something better. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is to try to restore brain function as best we can to a more normal physiological state. One of the ways we did this earlier is with deep brain stimulation. So that is, works on an electrical basis. We put a probe in the brain, we give an electrical impulse. It's, <coughs> powered by a generator in the chest wall, very much like a cardiac pacemaker. But it doesn't work through dopamine, it works through electricity. And the brain is a big computer, but the chemicals are the ones that are transmitting the action potentials. So it gave us an answer, but it still didn't mimic the normal physiological brain, which doesn't have to have probes in the brain. So that leads us to, well, what about biological implantable materials, that is stem cells, as a potential solution instead of having to have wires in your brain. So I put this slide up here about the criticisms of transplant stem cell therapy and Parkinson's disease because we want you to know we know. We know the criticisms, we're aware of them. Criticism in the scientific community is, is very necessary. It's what keeps us in line, it's what keeps us honest. It's what keeps us doing pure science. So we welcome the criticisms and we are here to address them. For instance, the use of embryonic or fetal tissue. Dr. Loring is going to talk about how that particular issue with this particular project has been eliminated. There's always the problem with the same thing with a kidney transplant or a liver transplant. If you put some other person's kidney into your body, you're going to have to have immunosuppressive drugs so it won't reject it. Well, immunosuppressive drugs have their own problems. They can be dangerous. Um, you might have to be on them for life. So we have to address that problem as well. We're gonna tell you about that. Lack of control of transplanted tissue causes variable results. All that means is with these earlier trials, we didn't really know how much dopamine those cells were producing. Loads of it, a little of it. We didn't have any way to measure. Now we do. 
and we'll be talking to you about how we've eliminated that particular problem as well. Next, um, we're going to talk to you about the history of the evolution of stem cell therapy in general. And to that end, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jean Loring, professor at the Scripps Research Institute and head of regenerative medicine at that institution. I really like working with clinicians. Um, it gives me this whole feeling of, of going from the bench to the bedside, which is um, really, I think, our goal. Um, and it should be the goal of scientists. What I'm going to talk to you about is why we think, because of the history of this field, that our approach is very straightforward and is going to work. And part of it is because there were some really brave pioneers who decided that you could treat Parkinson's disease with cell therapy. But the cells they picked, because of the time when it was done, the only cells that were stem cells and available came from fetuses, from aborted fetuses. And so there were two trials that were initiated, actually funded by our National Institutes of Health. They were double-blind trials, just like you would do for any, any drug. And uh, the results were really pretty astonishing. Um, disappointing in a way, but exhilarating in another way. So one of the, these researchers, Kurt Fried, did a double-blind study, and he treated 40 Parkinson's disease patients. And the results were pretty um, spectacular in some cases. Um, some of the people who received fetal cell tissue, they were able to give up their DOPA treatment, and they were able to function as normal people without disease for many, many years. Um, there was another trial done just about the same time in Florida, and the same results came from that. The problem was that the results were unpredictable. Sometimes younger patients did better. A lot of the um, results, whether, they were, whether the tissues are effective or not, was dependent on the quality of the tissue. And when you're working with aborted tissue, quality is not one of the things that you really have control over. So some of the people improved. You see a decrease in the symptoms of Parkinson's disease in some patients. You, at the same time, in their brains, you see they have more dopamine. So it, it makes sense. The way it's worked, the cells, it looks like the cells have actually been replaced. OK, so the things we learned from the fetal cell transplants were that the quality control issues simply were uncontrollable because you had to use multiple fetuses for each one of the, of the brain transplants, and there are various numbers and uh, types of brain cells in these parts of, of the little fetal brain that you were transplanting. And the unpredicted adverse outcome, which was so unpleasant, was the dyskinesias, which Dr. Dr. Hauser just mentioned to you. If the uh, balance is not quite right in the brain, then sometimes the result can be these uncontrolled movements. So we have now discovered that uh, what the source of those dyskinesias are, and it's the presence of a different cell type in those fetal cell tissues. It's a cell that is, instead of making dopamine, is making another neurotransmitter called serotonin. So this is an important thing to note, because when you're using fetal tissue, you don't have any control over this. Where I'm going to show you how we can control it with our approach. So, of course, I haven't even spoken about the legal and ethical issues, especially in the United States, if you're using fetal tissue. Uh, there are only a few people who are brave enough to really try this. So our study doesn't use embryonic tissue. It doesn't use fetal tissue. Instead, we're using stem cells. And we're using a remarkable method that was just developed about six years ago, in which you can make stem cells from a piece of skin tissue from any person. So what we're doing is what's called an autograft, that is the same, uh, putting the cells from the same person into that same person. But those cells have to be dopamine neurons, and so we're turning those cells into dopamine neurons and then putting them back into that same person. We have exquisite quality control over these populations. We can know exactly what cell we're putting in, what the characteristics are, what the composition of these cells are. So none of the problems that, that arose with fetal tissue should arise here. So let me tell you a little bit of background about uh, stem cells. This, this is uh, Stem Cells 101. Um, you've heard about them. And I think most of the ones you've heard about are actually stem cells that live in our bodies. They have two qualities, just, just two. One is that they continue to regenerate themselves. That's called self-renewal. 
and that they can differentiate, that is, turn into at least two kinds of cells. So examples of, of cells that we have in our tissue that can do that in our own bodies are things like our bone marrow stem cells, which give rise to all the blood cell types, and yet they keep renewing themselves. Okay, so there are two kinds of stem cells, and this is very important because in the lower part of this panel, um, there are all these multipotent or uh, somatic or adult stem cells. These are the ones that come from fat. These are the ones that come from bone marrow. Uh, there are also cells that you can actually isolate from people's brains that are capable of giving rise to, to new nerve cells. Unfortunately, none of these cells works very well in adults. And the issue with all the multipotent stem cells is that very few of them, especially the ones from bone and from fat, are incapable of making nerve cells. They cannot make dopamine neurons, so they can't make the cell type that we want. And instead of that cell type, now we have access to pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent means many, many powers. Pluripotent, many powers. These cells can give rise to every cell type in the body. So this is one of the ways we depict um, pluripotent stem cells often, is a, a tree with branches. And the, the pluripotent cells are here at the bottom, and they branch out and give rise to all sorts of cells. And here I've shown some of the ones that are important, the serotonin neurons that we don't want and the dopamine neurons that we do want. So the advantages of using pluripotent stem cells is that they can be turned into dopamine neurons. We can make large quantities of them, so we can, have, uh, we can set some aside to look at with various scientific methods and still have plenty to put into people's brains. Uh, we can produce them under quality controlled conditions and there are labs that are set up to do this, especially for clinical therapy, stem cell therapy. And so the cells are grown under what are called good manufacturing or GMP facilities. And also the advantage is that if you don't, if you use cells from the same person and put them back into their same brain, into their brain, it's very unlikely that you will need to immunosuppress. The cells should just integrate normally, just like the cells that were there and had died. Okay, so uh, just to review, um, we want to use cell therapy to, as a, uh, a transplant, an implant of a, of a cell, which is like a device that can release dopamine when needed and um, can be regulated by all the other cells in the nervous system. And of course, that would overcome all the issues of on-off, on-off with levodopa treatment. Now, there are two sources of pluripotent cells, and the one you may have heard of is an embryonic source. This is an embryo or, or a drawing of an embryo that has been donated by an in vitro fertilization clinic. It's about five days old. So these embryos, if you put them into a tissue culture dish and grow them in the right way, you will produce what are called embryonic stem cells. That's a type of pluripotent stem cell. However, in uh, 2007, Shinya Yamanaka in Japan uh, was able to show that you can take normal adult cells, just a little skin punch, a biopsy the size of an eraser, take it, put it into a culture dish, grow the cells from it, these are called dermal fibroblasts, and then by adding some molecular factors, we can turn them into cells that are indistinguishable from embryonic stem cells. They have all the capabilities. There was a uh, scientific publication that came out very recently, just late last year. A scientist there named June Takahashi has done the, um, the surrogate experiment in monkeys. So he took one monkey and made these induced pluripotent stem cells from it, made dopamine neurons. And he put those cells back into that monkey, and the monkey had Parkinson's symptoms that were induced by a drug. Okay, so we have two monkeys, both with Parkinson's symptoms. One of them has these iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells that maternal turned dopamine neurons. If you put those cells into the monkey that you got them from, the cells survive and you don't have an immune response, which is, we thought that would be the result, but we didn't know, and now we know. If you put those cells into the other monkey that is not related to the initial monkey, it, you do see an immune response and a lot of the cells die and they don't function as well. So this validates our approach, which is to individualize the therapy by using the cells from the person who has the disease to transplant them back into the same person. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, pass you over to my associate, um, Andres uh, Bratlil. He is a senior scientist, and he is the director of our Parkinson's stem cell program at the Scripps Research Institute. And he's going to tell you about the science that we're doing in the lab. Andres?
So I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about our project. Um, so first I wanted to show exactly what this looks like. And this is from our first patient. Um, and what you see in the upper left is what the skin biopsy looks like. And so it is really a little piece of skin that comes from an, um, somewhere on the arm. Uh, it's about the size of a pencil eraser. Um, from there, we can break up the cells that are in this biopsy and grow them out on a dish. And what we get are these dermal fibroblasts. And uh, these dermal fibroblasts are what we use to uh, turn them into pluripotent stem cells. And so when we do this by adding these molecular <coughs> factors that Dr. Loring was talking about. You can see, after we add these factors, these cells kind of they start out as these long, stringy cells. And then a couple of days later, they're already changing shape, shape and looking more like pluripotent stem cells. And then about a month later, you can see this is a pluripotent stem cell colony. And it looks exactly like an embryonic stem cell colony. It has all the same properties. If you showed this picture to someone who's been doing stem cell research their entire career, they couldn't tell you if it was an embryonic stem cell colony or an induced pluripotent stem cell colony. And the great thing about this in the lab is that we can do all these tests and analysis of these cells to make sure that they actually are pluripotent stem cells, that they're the cells that we think that they are before we move on to the next step. And then from here, we can take these cells and make any cell type in the body. And what the cells that we're interested in are, of course, the dopaminergic neurons. And so the question is, how do we take a cell that can become anything and make it in the cell type that we want? And the answer is that we go through, we guide these cells through the steps of development. Um, and this is really something that's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years, is, is making the right types of cells from pluripotent stem cells. So a lot of the, the advances in this field in the last couple of years is how can we guide these cells through the developmental stages so we can kind of coax them into being dopaminergic neurons and guide them into that stage so in the, in the end we get the right cells for using our, in our patients. So what we do is we start with pluripotent stem cells and then we change the different factors that, are, that these cells are grown in, different chemicals um, and, and different molecules that, that's added to the medium in which, which the cells are grown. And we can get a special type of neural precursor cell. And so this is the same cell that in the brain goes on to make dopaminergic neurons. And uh, from there, we can get these early, very early dopaminergic neurons. And this is the, 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 the cell that we've identified for, um, for transplantation into our patients. And that's because these cells have already committed to being dopaminergic neurons. So for, that means they're not going to become any other cell type. They no longer divide, which is a really nice, convenient um, characteristic of neurons. It's nice because once we transplant these cells into the patient, we no longer have any control over these cells. And so that's something that's very different from the fetal trial, where you're putting in stem cells, you're putting in different types of neurons in there, and you can't really control what's happening afterwards. So in our case, we control what types of cells that we're putting in because we don't have the control afterwards. So as long as we're putting dopaminergic neurons in, and we know that these cells are good cells, we can, high, we can expect to have good outcomes in our patients. So we can characterize these cells in the lab before we do any of the animal studies, before we do um, any, any, can get anywhere near patients. And so um, we start out with these pluripotent stem cells, but about 45 days later, we have these beautiful neural networks. So we've taken these cells that can become anything and made this really nice population of neurons. And so these neurons that we can show are actually dopaminergic neurons. They make dopamine, they express all the right genes and proteins that we would expect dopaminergic neurons to express. Um, another nice thing we can do is we can actually test individual cells to make sure that they're electrically the right types of cells. And so that's really important because the brain, like the heart, is really based on electrical signals and that's how the neurons communicate with each other, that's how they know to make dopamine. So in order to know that our cells are actually dopaminergic neurons and that they're functional, we can actually test individual cells with electrodes to see you know, if these cells are ranking the right. It's kind of like the, the pulse you see in an electrocardiogram. We can do this with the individual neurons and make sure that they're the right type of neurons. So an overview of the whole process, what we do is we start with the patient cells, or the skin cells. And you can see the skin cells are these really long, skinny cells. And then what we get are these pluripotent stem cells that express all the same factors of, of, of pluripotent stem cells. And so we go from one skin cell into we can make thousands or even millions of these pluripotent stem cells. And uh, like Dr. Loring said, from there we can characterize our cells and have plenty of cells that are left over to be put into the patients. From these pluripotent stem cells, we again, we make these dopaminergic neurons. And so you can see they make these beautiful images of these neurons that are really interconnected with each other. They're making connections with each other. We can tell that they're actually making dopamine and they're having the correct uh, electrical uh, characteristics of these cells. So now, what we've gotten to now is we've uh, identified our eight patients, we've biopsied our eight patients, and made stem cells from each of our patients. Uh, and now we've made dopaminergic neurons from our first two patients, and we tested them in the lab, everything looks good. We're ready to move on to the next phase, which is animal testing. 
And so now um, I'm excited to say that our, our first two patient cells are in animal testing now. And it's really important as we move forward with the FDA to be able to show that these cells are safe and that they can actually be effective in an animal model of Parkinson's. Basically what you do is you kill off all the dopaminergic neurons just on one side of the brain. When you inject an amphetamine into this rat, only the side of the brain that has dopaminergic neurons left can respond to the amphetamine. And so the rat will start turning in circles. And the reason that we like this, this assay is because it's very quantifiable. We can say, you know, the rat is turning in X number of rotations per minute. And so what we do is we'll take our patient's cells, this is what we've already done, and inject them into the other side of the brain that no longer has any dopaminergic neurons. And then we can test the rat every couple weeks in the same rotation. What they do is they put the rat in this bucket here, and you can count how many times that it rotates in one direction. And if the cells are working, if the cells are actually making dopamine, and if they're growing in the rat brain, um, then they'll respond to the amphetamine. And then what you'll start to see is that the number of rotations per minute starts to go down. Well, one reason why we're really excited about this and that we really think this is going to work is that because it's already been done. It's already been done using embryonic stem cells using the exact same method that we're using. And so what you see is that the untreated rat basically still rotates over and over again in the same direction. But if you treat the rat with these cells, the number of rotations per minute goes slowly down until you get to it's even. So you basically cured the rat of these motor symptoms in a, in a Parkinson's model. So in, in order to get FDA approval, there's really three different phases of the project, and that's why we've assembled this, this big team to work on this. We have the cell analysis, so making the cells in the lab first and making sure that they are the cells that we think they are, that they are dopaminergic neurons, that they are functional, that they're capable of making dopamine, and that's what we're doing at the Scripps Research Institute. Um, the next part is we have partners that are doing the animal studies, and they're looking for safety and for efficacy. And once we put these cells in, we can see, because we don't have control over the behavior after they're transplanted, we can see how are these cells behaving? You know, are they forming anything that we won't, don't want them to be? Are they making serotonergic neurons? Because we can characterize everything in the lab, but it really matters how these cells are acting inside um, an animal, inside, and that's how we can predict how these cells will act in our patients. And that's how we can also sh prove to the FDA that these cells are safe and that they'll work. Um, the third part is the, the, really the clinical side. How are we going to do the study? What are we going to look at? How are we going to decide whether the study worked or not? And so that's why we have Dr. Hauser and the clinical side of this project so that we can work, all work together in the scientists and the clinicians um, to really move this forward quickly towards FDA approval. So I put um, a little timeline here about where we are now in terms of FDA approval because everything has moved very quickly. We've gotten our patients, we've gotten our cells, we've made dopaminergic neurons, we're testing them in animals. So um, we're going to take our preliminary animal data and take that to the FDA. We plan on doing that in the next month, so right now we're putting together our package. Um, in the next six to nine months after that, what we want to do um, is the next step in talking with the FDA, and that's what's called a pre-investigational new drug. So um, the, one of the, the roles of the FDA is to protect and serve the interests of the public. And one of the ways that they do that is by regulating and improving any type of drug that people are using in, in people. And so the FDA has said that even a patient's own cells, once they're taken out of their body and changed in the lab, those cells can now be regulated as a drug. And so, you know, it's not necessarily bad. I don't want people to think that the FDA is the bad guy in this scenario because the FDA is really there to protect um, the patients and protect the public welfare because, um, you know, we know that people with Parkinson's, um, they're desperate for, for treatment. And, and I think one of the things that our project gives people is, is a hope for what can be, can be done in the future. But um, if, you're, if you're not working with the FDA, you, don't, you can't really trust that these cells are going to be safe. And so we're doing everything with the FDA to show that these cells are safe and that they're actually going to work. So that kind of leads me into this next part about why we're doing this through the FDA and why the FDA is not the bad guy. Because there's, there's really two different categories, general categories of studies. One is a study like ours where we're going through the steps with the FDA. And another one is other types of stem cells. I'm sure people have heard stem cell clinics that are treating people in Mexico or the Philippines um, or in China. Um, so that these, so these studies are not going through the FDA. And there's some really general differences, but they're very important that happen between these two different types of studies. One, a study that goes through the FDA really characterizes their cells first, and that's what we're doing now in the lab. Whereas a non-FDA approved study will say, you know, we're getting our cells from fat or we're getting our cells from bone marrow, but they don't really tell you what the cells are exactly. Um, 
Another, another sign that this study is not through the FDA is that they'll say we can take stem cells or we can treat Alzheimer's, we can treat Parkinson's, we can treat MS. Instead of us, we're saying we need to make dopaminergic neurons to specifically treat Parkinson's disease because that's what's lost in Parkinson's disease. So an another uh, difference is the studies like ours, we use scientific data that's been published and peer-reviewed in scientific publications as evidence that we think our, our study will work and evidence to show the FDA that our study will work. Um, whereas other non-FDA studies will use patient testimonials. And that's, that's a big difference is that you can go on these websites and you can see videos of people saying that, you know, I was treated with stem cells and everything works. And the reason I'm saying this is because really these non-approved stem cell trials, what it really amounts to is these patients that are paying money to be in what's really an uncontrolled experiment. And in FDA clinical trials, the patients don't pay for their treatment because it, it is an experiment and we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And that's why we do these, these clinical trials. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, we're really excited about the animal data that we're getting and where we're going in the future. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Sherry Gould from Summit for Stem Cell. She's been the inspiration behind um, the, the climbs and one of the leaders. And uh, she's also a nurse practitioner working with Dr. Melissa Hauser. Thank you. In 2010, July of 2010, actually, um, Dr. Hauser, with whom I work, approached me and said, Sherry, I really want to get involved um, with our patients with stem cell research. And um, it sounded exciting. And by the next afternoon, we had walked over to meet Dr. Jean Loring, who obviously was the best choice to collaborate with, as she has 30 years of, um, of work in the field of stem cell research. So we met with Jean, and we'd done our research, and we said, you know, Jean, we, you're doing amazing things in your lab in Alzheimer's, ALS, MS, Fragile X syndrome. So the big million-dollar question is, why not Parkinson's? And her answer was very short, very succinct, actually. And she said, money. Um, didn't have a grant for her project in Parkinson's, though she had already very much figured it out. When we asked her, well, what do you think a project like this might cost for a, a pilot project? And she immediately had the number, it was 300000 I thought, you know, people raise money all the time. I never doubted that we could raise 300000 but I wasn't quite sure how. And somehow popped into my brain, why not climb a huge mountain? Well, as fate would have it, I happened to see not one, but two patients that week in clinic and I was extremely excited about the project and had this kind of idea about Kilimanjaro and I said you know could you want to climb this mountain and we need to raise 300,000 and I promise you I had not one but two raise her hand and say I'll climb it with you and then I knew I had a project that we had a project we actually summited Mount Kilimanjaro 16 of us many of them that are here tonight, and we summited uh, Mount Kilimanjaro on September 17th of 2011. The thing that made this trip so incredibly special was not only did we have three people, three of our trekkers, three of our climbers, that actually had Parkinson's disease, but every single person in our trekking group was closely involved, had a, a family member, had a spouse, had a dad, had a grandfather, had a best friend who had Parkinson's. So this was an incredibly powerful group. And we were able to really raise a considerable amount of money. And more importantly, or as importantly, to really raise awareness of what it was we were raising money for. In October of 2013, once again, we gathered a group of 10 of us this time, three again with Parkinson's, and decided we needed to outdo that, that thing called Kilimanjaro and let's tackle the biggest mountain on the planet. So that we didn't go to the top, but what we did do is we went to the base camp of Mount Everest and even a few of us went above that to 18.5. There were 10 of us on that trip and three people had Parkinson's. That was a three week trek and um, very intense. Our group now, our advisory council, along with the eight patient participants that are incredibly involved in this project, and the trekkers, we have managed to raise, at this point, $700,000.
by total grassroots efforts. It's absolutely amazing. It's been people, patients, it's been families of the trekkers that, you know, they wrote letters, they communicated with people, and everyone contributed, small amounts, big amounts, but the entirety led to $700,000. We did it by other things, too. We did a 10K walk. We, we did a big gala. We have done parties for Parkinson's where people with Parkinson's actually opened up their homes and had small parties where they each brought in another $1,500. There is um, a p person who just called me a couple days ago. He's doing an international skateboard competition. And he, his father has Parkinson's. He called me and he said, we are gonna have the proceeds from this competition go to Summit for Stem Cell. The reason I give you these examples is we need your help. We need your skills. We need your talent. We need your connections of people that you know in the community, outside the community, in the nation, in the world, that can help us. A politician, a famous person that can be our spokesperson. There's an incredible expression that um, I actually picked up at Dr. Loring's office when we were doing a lab tour early on in this project, and one of her researchers described stem cell research for Parkinson's as being the lowest hanging fruit. And the reason it's the lowest hanging fruit is that we're simply replacing the neurons that many of you in this room right now have lost throughout the course of your disease. We're not trying to do anything more complicated than that. I'm not oversimplifying it, but really we're refilling the bucket. At this point, I'd like to reintroduce Jerry Henberger. Hey. The exciting thing here is that it wasn't just one person, it was all of you that's participated in helping fund to get to where we are today. It's the remarkable efforts of people who are willing to risk their lives for a cause. And it's for people that you and I are all close to. That if you look at the back of this, there's a little pyramid and it shows that we've raised $700,000. There's a big way to go on this pyramid. What people have done have been remarkable. The doctors, the science, how far this has progressed, how close we are to being in a patient where, where this can change the lives, it can change the course of the disease. If you'd like to contribute, we'd love to have you participate. If you'd like to donate, we'd love to talk to you about that. So thank you very, very much for your participation. Thank you.